Hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I know you can see half of me. I guess I'll just go down here until we get a camera adjustment. Yes, this is Jeff Williams. I'm the host of North Star Oasis. We're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload on this 28th day of March 2019. You know, we're already a quarter of the way through the year already. And we still haven't hit 70 degrees yet, but we've come close at least. Uh, yes, there's more f uh, flooding is becoming more apparent up here. And if you happen to be in the Twin Cities area or any, anywhere along the St. Croix, Minnesota or Mississippi River Valleys, please be safe. As we have finally now get the northern snowpack melted and that means the flood rotters are rising. And I know there have been a lot of people in uh, Stillwater who have been very active in making sure that the sandbags are up and everything is uh, going well before the flood waters come. So just wanted to put that out there for you to be safe because that's the one thing with flooding is you just never know when the flash flooding is going to happen and we wouldn't want to see any catastrophe locally. Property damage, I'm not concerned about that. It's the cost of human lives that are that's more concerning. But anyhow, we are going to actually start today talking about Stanislav Petrov. Who? He's a former Soviet military officer, and he's known in the West as the man who saved the world uh, for his role in averting a nuclear war in 1983. Over a false missile warning, and it was at the height of the Cold War, he passed away. Uh, he passed away a while back. Uh, this is from September 20th, 2017. But only now are we really starting to see this uh, being known. And so we just wanted to start off by paying tribute to somebody who has really staved off a thermal global nuclear war. I think 1983, that would have been about the time that the movie War Games came out. And the funny thing is, uh, with War Games, it was all over a computer glitch that almost created thermal global nuclear war. And there was actually a guy in the Soviet Union who did avert that uh, by not paying attention to the uh, satellite. satellite. Anyhow, we're going to show you a story out of RT. That's the uh, Russian news agency. And they're going to talk about uh, Stanislav uh, Petrov. have saved the world from annihilation. Most historians point to the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 as being the closest the world came to all-out nuclear war. But as RT's Tom Barton reports, the world may have come even closer to mutually assured destruction than that. For decades, men in bunkers watched their screens and warning lights every hour of every day, waiting for the Cold War to go nuclear. So too was the situation just after midnight on September the 26th, 1983. Stanislav Petrov was the lieutenant colonel in charge of the Soviet Union's early warning radar system in a bunker near Moscow. Then it happened. When I first saw the alert message, I got up from my chair. All my subordinates were confused. So I started shouting orders at them to avoid panic. I knew my decision would have a lot of consequences. The radar was showing a single missile inbound from the United States. Now the race was on. Was it real or a computer error? His boss accepted over the phone it was a likely fault. But as soon as he hung up... The siren went off for a second time. Giant blood-red letters appeared on our main screen, saying start. It said that four more missiles had been launched. To Petrov, it didn't add up. Any attack by the US would have been all out to try and cripple a Soviet response. But if they were real, he had only 30 minutes to tell his superiors before the warheads hit. My cozy armchair felt like a red-hot frying pan, and my legs went limp. I felt like I couldn't even stand up. That's how nervous I was when I was taking this decision. Petrov stuck to his decision broke Soviet military rules by not telling his superiors and was proved right. There were no missiles. He never had the authority to press the button himself, 
But how close had the world come to nuclear war? At that time, it seemed that our country was surrounded by enemies, but was strong enough to retaliate. The Soviet Union and the USA were too strong, and both our countries had too many conflicts of interest in various parts of the world. For Petrov, the answer is more simple. We've never been as close to a nuclear war, neither before nor later on. It was the very climax. Petrov broke military doctrine but possibly saved the world. He has since been given an award by the Association of World Citizens and honored by the UN. He says he's not a hero and was just doing his job. Stanislav now lives a quiet life in this block of flats northeast of Moscow. But although he says what happened that night in 1983 is just a footnote, it may turn out to be the most important footnote of Cold War history. Tom Barton, RT, Moscow Region. So he uh, passed away on May 19th, 2017. Uh, again, we just never really heard much about his passing. Uh, the interesting thing is the film War Games, which I, I'm sure many of you have seen by now, was released uh, at the Cannes Film Festival on May 7th, 1983. And it was uh, given a wide release in the United States on June 3rd, 1983. The... Uh, Incident with uh, Petrov was September 26, 1983. So the funny thing is, and I say funny, you know, meaning the uh, um, intriguing thing about this is that War Games came out a couple of months before this incident actually happened. And I remember when the film came out, how so many people, and I was. 12 years old at the time. I mean, it was a really scary thing to think that a computer could actually do that. And then we didn't find out until at least 10, 20 years later that a computer almost did that. So, you know, we're here to pay tribute to Petrov for using his gut instinct instead of just relying on Soviet doctrine because we could have actually been back at war, or been at war with the then Soviet Union, and a lot of people around the world would have died. I'm going to use it as a transition because I hear so many people out there who are talking out of fear. Fear of nuclear war with North Korea. But yet we have a president who for the first time in the almost 70 year history of the country of North Korea actually talked to the North Korean president twice. I hear all this talk about Russian collusion kind of bringing out the uh, old Cold War mentality. I thought the, and trying to heat it up again. Uh, I thought the Cold War had ended. That's what I was told back in 1991. Oh, the Cold War's over. We won the Cold War without firing a shot. I've heard that now for almost 30 years. And yet, I hear more and more from the political left, not just your Democrats, but those who are further to the left, about how perilous times we're in. I remember, well, we just had the Green New Deal. They got shot down in the Senate by a vote of 0 to 57, 57 votes against. 43 Democrats voted present. Did Alexandria, oh, she's in the House. Uh, so, you know, you don't even have Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez able to vote on her own bill. But all of this panic, we're going to die in 12 years if we don't address climate change. Oh, Trump is a bad guy because of Russian collusion. All this made up crap. And it's incessant because it never stops. There's a reason behind that. You cannot argue with the left. And that's today's Prager University segment. Do you and I share the same goals? If we do, we can disagree, even strongly disagree, and still have a productive discussion. We might even reach a compromise. But if we don't share the same goals, then what? Then, rhetorically speaking, we're at war and only one side can win. Let me explain. My parents and brother lean more to the liberal side of the political spectrum than I do. We argue, 
we slightly nudge each other, we change opinions a little bit, and then we go back to Scrabble. They were very upset when President Trump withdrew from the Paris Climate Accords. I was happy. We argued about it, but it was all good because we share the same goals. We all want clean air and water for our children. We all want to develop clean energy. We want America's economy to prosper. We want to be less reliant on fossil fuels. I thought the Accords were a bad deal for America. The best way to lower carbon emissions, in my opinion, is to let the free market and American ingenuity loose on the problem. They, in contrast, think the government needs to step in, fund the research, and keep the corporations in line. Doesn't matter, because we have the same goal, a healthy planet. We also disagree on gun control. My brother's a little more with me, but my dad wants a lot more regulation because he wants fewer school shootings. So do I. So does my brother. But I believe if a potential killer knew he'd encounter teachers and administrators well-trained in the use of weapons, we'd have less shootings. Different solutions, shared goal. I've always thought this is how America is supposed to work. Liberals and conservatives respectfully arguing over the best solution to a shared goal. But now there's a third party in the game, the left. And they're changing the rules. When I was growing up, the left was on the fringe, but now they've moved into the mainstream. They've pretty much taken over our educational system. They're in the media, in corporate HR departments, and more and more, sad to say, in the Democratic Party. The left doesn't share the same goals that liberals and conservatives do. They have a whole different set of goals. Let me give you some examples. Raising kids without a gender identity or encouraging them to question their sexual identity, this to me is a form of child abuse. I don't care who's doing it, parents, teachers, doctors. Their goal is not my goal. Here's another one. Demonizing white people and males for the world's problems is not part of my value system. There is no shared goal in that. I believe in merit and character over race. But now it's cool to say that white males have done all the bad things in the world. I have two little boys. I get angry just thinking about people telling them they're responsible for racism and sexism. Beautiful little children who just dance in the kitchen and smile. So that's not a shared goal. Here's the third example. People can differ about how many legal immigrants America should allow into the country. But when it comes to whether America should have open borders, well, there's no shared goal there. A country with open borders ceases to be a distinct country. And I want America to remain America. All these ideas, and I could give you a dozen more, are coming from the left. They want to turn the history of Western civilization, of America, a history I'm very proud of, into a highlight reel of human errors. These ideas threaten everything I cherish, my family, my community, my country. And what does the left offer in its place? Nothing constructive that I can see. What are their goals? Kids with no clear sexual identity? Group think based on race, gender, class, no national pride or borders. Are you okay with that? My issue is not with liberals like my brother and my dad and a lot of my friends. We can argue until the cows come home. My issue is with the left because we don't share goals. This war of goals isn't coming, it's here. You need to decide which side you're on, the liberals and conservative side or the left's. Your future depends on it. I'm Owen Benjamin for Prager University. And that's kind of what we've seen with uh, this whole Russia-Trump collusion stuff. Because it's a war. We don't like the guy who's in office, so we're going to investigate him for the next two years and hope that he can be trashed in the halls of public opinion and we can get our way. And with that, you know, we've heard so much about the Mueller investigation. We have. But the Mueller investigation came to a close as um, the special prosecutor came out with this, uh, the announcement that the Trump campaign did not coordinate with Russia. So let's take a look at the uh, Associated Press story on this. 
bringing to a close a probe that has shadowed President Donald Trump for nearly two years, the Justice Department said Sunday that special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation did not find evidence that Trump's campaign conspired or coordinated with Russia to influence the 2016 presidential election. Mueller also investigated whether Trump obstructed justice but did not come to a definitive answer. In a four-page letter to Congress summarizing Mueller's report, Attorney General William Barr said the report does not exonerate the president on obstruction and instead sets out evidence on both sides of the question. President Trump immediately claimed vindication. There was no collusion with Russia. There was no obstruction and none whatsoever. And. It was a complete and total exoneration. It's a shame that our country had to go through this. In reality, Mueller's investigation left open the question of whether Trump obstructed justice by firing FBI Director James Comey and drafting an incomplete explanation about his son's meeting with a Russian lawyer during the campaign. That left it to the attorney general to decide. Barr said he and his deputy, Rod Rosenstein, determined the evidence is, quote, not sufficient to establish that the president committed an obstruction of justice offense. Democrats vowed to press on with their own investigations. Kelly Daschle, Associated Press. Now, of course, you hear, oh, well, the, uh, it leaves open that he may have done this. I've been hearing this all week in the, in the mainstream media. But the fact is, if there was actually something to it, and there was enough evidence there, Mueller would have actually referred for charges. So this again is more of the progressive far left spin, their push. They're at, they're at war with the average American. And mind you, I'm talking about your far left people who consider themselves progressive. I'm not talking about your standard union Democrat who, per the Prager University uh, video, we have shared goals. I've got many friends who vote Democrat who I have shared goals with. They may not like Trump, but they love America. And they don't believe a third of this hogwash that's being passed around, you know, the whole gender stuff and all of that. And yet it is that small group that has the political agenda that has power in our media, our entertainment, our academia, and our uh, newspapers. And they're the ones, of course, who form public opinion based upon their power in these entities. And so uh, now we're hearing, oh, well, Congress is going to do the investigation, yada, yada. But there's nothing there. Because if there was something there, Mueller would have specified that. I also find it funny how in the media they read the same four-page letter from William Barr to Congress that I did. I read the letter and I didn't come across with the same attitude of that uh, there's still a window of opportunity for prosecution. I did not see that at all. What I did see was that the report cannot be released publicly because of what is considered uh, from, I can't remember what U.S. code number, but there's what's called a 6E provision, which is not to be released. And Mueller and Barr are going to be meeting to go through all of the 6E security stuff. It has been brought to my attention that 30% of that material in that report comes from the grand jury. The thing is, the grand jury stuff cannot be released to the public. So that's why it's going to take a little while to actually see stuff that's in the report. But when I read the letter, it was pretty straightforward. There's nothing to see here, folks. That's what Mueller and Barr have said. There's nothing to see here. If there was, you'd know about it. But we're going to persist in hearing more and more and more about how there's always the possibility, and then we're going to have the uh, libel in chief, uh, Adam Schiff, try to uh, investigate all of this in Congress to find out there's nothing there. That's why they hired a special prosecutor to begin with. And we're going to continue this because that's the way the progressive, far left socialist communist wing of the Democratic Party operates. Now, uh, President Trump did make one brief statement 
uh, when he got off the helicopter on the White House lawn. Let's take a look at what he said. I just want to tell you that America is the greatest place on earth. The greatest place on earth. Thank you very much. Now, whether you're a Republican or whether you're a Democrat, whether you're a Libertarian, Constitutionalist, Green Party person, I hope we can find that that's a shared goal. I hope that that's something that you can agree with President Trump on. Regardless if you personally like the man or not, he is right. America is the greatest place on earth. Now, if you really want to know the story behind Russian collusion, and I really hope that we can actually get another special prosecutor to actually prosecute what actually happened with these fake documents, with this whole collusion story, which has been false, which is completely false. Former Secret Service agent Dan Bongino actually just came out with a book about Russian collusion investigation. And what he has to say actually will blow your mind. I've watched this video a couple of times. Uh, some of the documents that he specifies in this, I've actually looked them up. He is speaking the truth. This is a guy who was a cop, he became a Secret Service agent. He's done investigations. He's looked at this from a legal and jur jurisprudence perspective. And it's quite eye-opening. So now that the Mueller investigation is over, let's take a look at what really, really happened with this whole investigation. Cleanup operation. Here's how this whole thing starts against Donald Trump. During the election, the Obama administration, which had done whatever it wants because the media is complete, the media is lost in this country, folks. Total, there's no media. Uh, forget it. That, 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 that's dead and buried. The media is done. They don't do journalism anymore. It's activism, nothing more, right? The Obama administration had grown comfortable with the idea of weaponizing government against their political enemies, and it happened over and over again. We had the IRS scandal, we had the AP phone record scandal, the Jim Rosen Fox News scandal, and I ask you this, what happened to any of the people involved? Anyone? Yeah, the answer is nothing. I, I, I have to do zeros like this now, because I used to do zeros like this, but I found out through the liberal media that somehow this means like a white power symbol now or some. I thought it meant okay or zero, but the media says, uh, no, I'm serious, like these idiots in the media will tell you. So now I do zeros like that because I'm like afraid of some media idiot. Uh, these people are crazy. The Obama administration had gotten completely comfortable with the idea of abusing government for their political means. So what happens? They, they, this plan gets hatched, and I'm going to be candid with you. Where exactly it's hatched, nobody is yet sure of to this day. Matter of fact, if you're familiar with my commentary on Fox, I say often one of the great mysteries of this case is what's paragraph one? Paragraph one, what do I mean by that? When I was a federal agent, when you arrest someone, you have to do what's called an MR, a memorandum report. Paragraph one of that MR is always how the case started. I got a call from Jane Doe, bank fraud investigator, said this credit card number was stolen on April 14, 2015. I made a few calls, and the next thing you know, it's an 80-page report about this massive scheme. Paragraph one, though, always lays it out. Always. Do you know to this day we still have no idea what paragraph one, the why they started to spy on the Trump team was? Now, I get it. It was for political. I get that. But at some point, somebody, you have to understand, folks, how to put down on paper a semi-legitimate reason to start the most massive spying operation in a political campaign in U.S. history. Do you know nobody to this day will tell you what that is? I know what it is. 
So part, the first plan they do to hit the Trump team, folks, is they learn to manipulate these, these uh, about queries in the, in the NSA database. The NSA has a database of a whole boatload of information, metadata, texts, that kind of stuff. How it works is too complicated in the time I have. But what you can do is you can query that NSA system, and you can get a whole lot of information. But what happens? About, this is plan A. This is how they're going to get the information. I hope, if I'm not following, please stop me, because this is important. The Obama administration figures out that through unmasking, in other words, wiretapping people, pretending they're targeting foreigners, and then querying information in this database, that they can get all the political operation, opposition research in the world that they need against the Trump team. It's beautiful. No one's going to call them out. The media's on their side, right? But there's a good guy in this. There's a white hat. Somebody in the government sniffs this thing out. That's why I tell you, this wasn't plan A. This was the plan. They were going to unmask people, wiretap people, and they were going to query this NSA database and get all the information they needed about the Trump team. But somebody smells a, uh, smells a problem, and he's not having it. And he's the white hat. He's the good guy in this story. And it's Mike Rogers of the NSA. Mike Rogers of the NSA senses that there's something wrong about these about queries. In other words, who's tapping into the database here and making political queries? Now, folks, some of you, I, I don't know what your politics, I assume most of you are conservative, libertarian, or Republican, but that's fine either way. If you doubt any of what I'm telling you, just Google the FISA Intelligence Surveillance Court, their report on about queries. Because Mike Rogers goes to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court and says, Houston, we got a problem. These queries are supposed to follow very specific guidelines about terrorism and, and, and all these metrics have to be. You can't just spy on Americans in the database. The FISA court looks into it, comes back with a report that was released in March of 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, that is devastating. If you haven't read it, you were do, read it, you were doing yourself a great disservice. Page 80 specifically is horrifying. Apparently, the NSA database was being queried by private contractors working with the FBI. These were not even government officials. People within the government were using private contractors to query information they had no, no judicial or legal authority whatsoever to look at. Roger smells a rat. People panic in the government. Now, conveniently, what happens right after the election? I'm going to put these pieces together and things will start to make sense. Donald Trump's elected. He's the president-elect, right? Ten days after the election, Rogers, who knows this has been going on the whole time, these unmaskings, the tapping of the... Now does the Donald Trump tweet, they tap Trump Tower, then how does it make sense? He got the wording wrong. He didn't understand exactly how it worked, but the idea was not wrong. Donald Trump's not stupid, trust me. Guy got elected president, earned a billion dollars. I, I love, by the way, I love how these journalists criticize him. Journalists, the guy's making twenty-five thousand dollars a year writing clickbait pieces for BuzzFeed. Like Donald Trump's an idiot. The hard pass, brother. Like, well, the, the guy just won the pre he, he runs for office the first time and he becomes the president. But we're, yeah, yeah. Let me listen to Joey Bag of Donuts at BuzzFeed. You're right. You've got this. It's like so. So about ten days after the election, Donald Trump. Someone goes up to visit Donald Trump in Trump Tower. <laughs> Who visits him? Mike Rogers. But Rogers doesn't tell anyone. This is going to trip you out totally. He doesn't tell anybody in the White House he's going up there. He visits Trump in Trump Tower, conveniently 10 days after the election, which from my experience in the Secret Service, is just enough time for them to go up to Trump Tower, WACA, the White House Communications Agency, for the president-elect, and set up a skiff where they can talk privately, a sensitive compartmentalized information facility. In other words, a place where no one can listen in. Rogers gives it about 10 days, goes up there, has this big meeting with Donald Trump, and what happens the very next day? Donald Trump evacuates Trump Tower and goes to Bedminster, New Jersey to never return for another meeting. You think that was a coinky dink? Like he did that by accident? Oh, let's just go up to Bedminster. I got nothing else to do. Now, again, this is all in the book, in intricate detail. The greatest spy story ever told, except the fact that it actually happened, and it happened against you. 
Rogers has this meeting. Trump evacuates Trump Tower. The very next day, the Obama administration comes out and calls for somebody to be fired. Who's that somebody? Mike Rogers. And they start blaming it on things like drone strikes and other stuff. Like, really? Could you be any more obvious? The Obama administration knows Rogers is the good guy and fills Trump in on this entire debacle. He probably goes up there and says, brother, they're spying on you, like right now. He doesn't know, but now he does. So he leaves. All of a sudden, people start resigning from the federal government after that. You know who also resigns? Bob Hannigan. Now, who's Bob Hannigan? Bob Hannigan is the head of the uh, GCHQ, which is the British NSA. Well, why do you think the head of the British NSA would resign right after that Rogers meeting, right after Trump finds out about this massive spying operation? I'm going to tell you why right now. I'm not taking a selfie of you. I'm not taking a selfie of myself. I'm going to read to you a headline. This is from CNN. See it right there? I didn't Photoshop this. <laughs> April 14th, 2017. Remember who Bob Hannigan is. He's the head of the British NSA. British intelligence passed Trump Associates' communications with Russians on to U.S. counterparts. You think I'm making this up? That's CNN. I didn't write it. They wrote that. So not only is the United States government in Plan A weaponizing its intelligence community to listen in and computer search the Trump team to hurt them during the campaign for political oppo, they're working with the British and the Australians to pass information about the Trump team onto the Obama administration. Don't take it from me. Take it from CNN. Yeah. They find out about this. Now, this thing breaks down about halfway through. They move on to Plan B. Sorry, there's a lot more to Plan A, but I, I, in the interest of time, I want to get through this because the cleanup operation is important. They move on to Plan B. What's Plan B? They realize Rogers is on to them. They're like, hey, folks, we better ease up on the unmasking and the tapping into the database. People are getting caught. This is probably not good. We're leaving a massive paper trail. And what if we lose, right? They move on to Plan B. Plan B is crossfire hurricane. They say, well, listen, if we can't spy on them illegally, let's just spy on them legally. We have this beautiful thing called the FISA court where we can walk into the FISA court, we can get a warrant on somebody, and when you get a warrant on somebody in the Trump team, they have this beautiful thing for the Obama administration called the two-hop rule. Well, it's for everyone, not just for Obama. Meaning, if I spy on you and you're a member of the Trump team, I can hop to everybody you emailed and then everybody they emailed. So basically, all I need to do is get a FISA warrant on the guy cleaning the floors in Trump Tower, and I've got everyone. Because if he emailed his boss and his boss emailed Don Jr., I get everybody. Beautiful, right? Not really. Because they were stupid. They were dumb. And they screwed up. The problem with the FISA court, unlike the unmaskings and the tapping into the database, is they had to produce actual evidence in front of a judge. There was a judge in a FISA court that needed evidence that the Trump team was working on behalf of a foreign power, but critically doing it in violation of a, at least one U.S. law. Folks, they had nothing. They had zero. Do you understand they, to this day, have absolutely zero, zero, remember, don't do it one hand, it's a big mistake, media people, you'll be, in a, you'll be a, a white power person after that, you always do it that way. They had zero evidence at all. Of, I'm, the funny thing, I'm only half kidding, that's how worried I am about the media, they're so crazy these days, right? They had nothing on collusion, nothing, zero. So what does the FBI and the, uh, the, the, the State Department and the DOJ do? They say, well, we don't really have any evidence. Let's just make it up. We've got this guy we worked with in the past, this, this guy Christopher Steele. Now I'm going to do this. I'm not taking a selfie again. I'm not taking a picture of you. Don't you worry. I'm going to read to you another headline. You need to write this down because this one's going to blow your mind. Any of you read the dossier? You haven't, right? Not many people have. You should. If you haven't read the dossier, don't you worry. Because the dossier was already written back on April 17th of 2007. You're like, ah, what do you mean? I don't get it. Even 2017, right? No, 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 no. I didn't get that wrong. It's written right here in the Wall Street Journal on April 17th, 2007. 
Who's the author of this critical Wall Street Journal piece? Glenn Simpson and Mary Jacoby, his wife. Glenn Simpson, the purveyor of Fusion GPS. The article is called, How Lobbyists Help Ex-Soviets Woo Washington. Folks, I dare you to take a moment and read that piece. Put it next to the dossier. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's the same story. It was written 11 years ago. Glenn Simpson clearly had this information about Russian influence in Washington. He wrote 10 years ago. Read the names in the article. You know who appears in this article? Paul Manafort, all of these players. So what likely happened after Plan A collapses is they say, listen, let's go to the FISA court and do this legally, but we need evidence. We don't have evidence. Don't worry. Hillary Clinton's got a guy at Fusion GPS, says he's got a story to tell. Ladies and gentlemen, Glenn Simpson took his Wall Street Journal piece like it was a movie script, scratched out the names, put Donald Trump's name in there and said, look, do I got a story for you guys? It's all BS. The whole dossier is crap. Read the article. It's a movie script they recycled. It's a, it's a fairy tale. It's an Aesop's fable. It's made up. It's a scam. There is not a scintilla of evidence that it's true. Now, the big question on plan B till I move to the mop-up operation, plan C. Now they're in trouble. They're in a lot of trouble. Because they realize the dossier in and of itself is crap. And a lot of people... All right, I'm going to just... Let us just take a pause here. Soak up that information. When he talks about the story, when I first saw this maybe six months ago, I actually looked up the story, and yes, it is bona fide true that it is right there. That a lot of the players of Paul Manafort and all in company, you know, th there was a relationship. These people knew who these people. I mean, and going back to 2016 in that presidential race, if you were watching North Star Oasis back then, I even said that Trump has to distance himself from Paul Manafort because Manafort is the weak link. I said that without even having read the article then and without any of the stuff that's come out since, just because even if by looking at Wikipedia you could see Paul Manafort's uh, fingerprints on Ukraine-related issues. So, Mangino was absolutely right. This reads like a bad movie script. It's already been written, and it's now being recycled. He is 100% correct on that. And, you know, some of the other stuff and documentation that he brought up, I've looked at that. I, I picked this video apart, and I made sure that when he says, look this up, I looked it up just to see if he's telling the truth or pulling, pulling a fast one. He is telling the truth. So now that we've got to this point, we're going to go back to Dan Bongino and we're going to get a little bit more. People at the Bureau know it. They need to buttress it with some stuff to make it a little, make it a little harder. Now's where the Michael Cohen story comes in, Trump's lawyer. In the dossier is a very specific allegation, right? That Michael Cohen, Trump's lawyer, went over to Prague to set up this whole information exchange with the Russians, right? Well, what's the problem? Michael Cohen had never been to Prague, and his passport proved it. Where do you think they got that name, Michael Cohen? You're darn right. They probably were in that NSA database looking up a Michael Cohen, and they got the wrong guy. I know there's only one Dan Bongino. I can tell you for sure there are a whole lot of Michael Cohens. Are you right? John Smith, John Brown, Cohen, these are common last names. They got the wrong Michael Cohen. So now you should be asking yourself, who the heck was Glenn Simpson dealing with in the government that gave him that name? And how did they get it? Plan B falls apart too. Plan B falls apart because something happens in November. Donald Trump wins. Nobody, I'm telling you, take it to the bank, cash this check, and spend the money. Nobody saw that coming. No one. Everybody thought Hillary Clinton was going to get in. This was all going to go away. They were going to appoint their own attorney general, probably John Brennan. And this story is never, ever to see the light of day, not in their lifetimes. But make no mistake, they know what they did. They all know what they did. Every single one of them. 
So they have to move on to plan C. Plan C, I call it clean up on aisle four. Now they're in trouble. They know they've got white hats in the government. I know one of them right now that's still in the FBI that's unquestionably cooperating with this investigation if you know how to read the tea leaves. And if you read the book, you'll figure out who it is. People start cooperating and talking, and now people are panicking. Now does John Brennan's meltdown after the election make sense? He's the head of the intelligence community who, again, another thing for you to Google, but it's all in the book, again, who do you think John Brennan met with right before the election at the, quote, director level as reported on by multiple media outlets? Bob Hannigan, the same guy from the British intelligence agency that quits right after Trump's election. He quits 10 days after and doesn't tell anybody about it. He says, oh, I'm leaving for family reasons. What do you mean? You related to Donald Trump? What do you mean family reasons? Family reasons, you're leaving because Donald Trump got elected. Who also quits? John Carlin. Who's John Carlin? He's the head of the Department of Justice National Security Division, the final division in the Department of Justice to put their John Hancock on the FISA warrant. He quits right after the election. Who did John Carlin work for? Now clean up on our four is going to start to make sense. Who did John Carlin work for before he got there into the DOJ? He's Bob Mueller's chief of staff. Aww. He was Bob Mueller's chief. Now does Bob Mueller make sense? Clean up, aisle four, get the mops out. Everybody realizes they're all going down. They faked the FISA warrant. They have been involved in massive unmaskings. Susan Rice, Samantha Power. They have been uh, busted by the FISA court, tapping into the NSA database for about queries. They're, they left a paper trail 65 miles long. Bob Mueller has to clean this whole mess up. Bob Mueller is the only, do you notice how right away they had the name? So Bob Mueller's old chief of staff, he's the cleanup guy. Bob, make, listen, make no mistake. Bob Mueller's job right now is one thing and one thing only. Keep the heat on Donald Trump relentlessly for anything. Jaywalking, ripping off mattress tags, combing his hair the wrong way. Keep the attention on Trump no matter what because the minute the Bob Mueller thing is dissolved, all of this is going to come out, and it is hell hath no fury. It, folks, they left a paper trail. They can't run from this. Mueller is brought in to get Trump impeached because they don't want any of this to see the light of day. Now, why Mueller? Mueller knows every player involved in this and has intimate connections with all of them. The guy who signs off on the BS FISA warrant, John Carlin, his old chief of staff, his chief bulldog in the case, Andy Weissman. Andrew Weissman worked with Bob Mueller. Andy Weissman was the chief prosecutor on the Enron case when Bob Mueller was the FBI director. Remember the Enron case that they screwed up royally? That's how they know each other. Andy Weissman hates Donald Trump. He's on emails congratulating Sally Yates for telling Donald Trump to go pound sand. Look, it's better. Who else does Bob Mueller know? On Bob Mueller's Enron team, it all goes back to Enron. That same Enron team, headed by Andy Weissman, had another lead lawyer on the case. Who was it? Catherine Rumler. Who's Catherine Rumler? Obama's White House counsel, who was Obama's lawyer while all of this was going on. They know each other. Now you may say, fine, so Bob Mueller knows Obama's lawyer why this whole Spygate thing was going on. What's the big deal? You Google George Nader, Daily Beast, you can read an article today. Just popped today before we showed up. One of Bob Mueller's lead cooperators in this case who's been selling out members of the Trump team from day one is a guy named George Nader. Who's George Nader's lawyer? Catherine Rumler, Obama's White House counsel and Bob Mueller's buddy. The lawyer for the lead witness in this case feeding information to Mueller is Obama's White House counsel, otherwise known as the fixer. She fixed everything for them. She was involved in Benghazi. She was involved in the IRS. She was involved in the Secret Service scandal. Just Google her name, put in any one of those things, and who's the person giving the statement? Catherine Rumler. Who was also on that Enron task force? Lisa Monaco. 
Barack Obama's Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor in the White House while all of this was going on. They all know each other. Finally, and I'll take some questions. Your final piece to the cleanup on aisle four operation. Who else does Bob Mueller know? Who now has judicial, uh, excuse me, legislative, uh, uh, who has control over this, I should say, right now in the Department of Justice, right? Rod Rosenstein, right? Because Sessions had recused himself, now Whitaker's in there, uh, which was a good appointment, right? A case happens a little while ago, the 10X case. It's around 2015 or so. It happens in Maryland. I'm familiar with it because I worked in Maryland as a Secret Service agent in Baltimore. I wasn't involved in that case at all, but I know the office well. The 10X case goes down in Maryland. The 10X case, a cooperator for the United States government paid $50,000 by the FBI. Comes to the FBI with some troubling information that the Russians are helping the Iranians build their nuclear program and that there's a company helping Russians get a hold of our uranium. It's called the 10X case. It was the precursor to something you may have heard about, the Uranium One operation. The same players are involved. The case gets, uh, gets thrown out on a, on, a, on a BS press release on a Friday night so nobody will pay attention. Everybody's gag ordered and it all goes away. That the Obama administration, an FBI paid informant, admitted that we were giving the Russians uranium while they were building the Iranian nuclear program and chanting death to America. Who was the lead prosecutor on that 10X case, the precursor to Uranium One? Rod Rosenstein. And who's the FBI director? Bob Mueller. Folks, they all know each other. This is the biggest scam in American history. Folks, I beg of you. I really do. You cannot let your uh, legislative people, your congressmen or anyone off the hook, whatever connections you have, you need to keep the heat on this. Because if these people don't go down the right way, unlike the Obama administration tried to do it to us, this will happen again. I'm telling you what they did was such a grotesque, horrendous abuse of power. It disgusts me to this day, and I will never, ever forget that story about that guy we arrested and his crying kid that morning who wasn't going to see his dad for another year. That's a horrible thing to have to do to someone, and it's a grotesque thing to do to someone to unleash the power of the federal government when they did nothing wrong. And Donald Trump did nothing wrong. And if you read the book, and by the way, one last thing before I get to the questions. You, it's not a narrative. You don't have to read it straight through. It's written like a police file. I think that's why it's been selling like crazy. You can read the last chapter first. You can go right, it's written like a police file because the names, like I said, this is an hour long speech I compressed into 20 plus minutes. The names never stop coming up again, ever. Oleg Deripaska, connected to Vladimir Putin, who's connected to Adam Waldman, a lobbyist who's emailing and texting Mark Warner, a Democrat on the Senate committee. Who's Waldman working for too? Christopher Steele, the guy working for Hillary. They're connected to the Russians. The people that show up at the Trump Tower meeting, Veselnitskaya with Don Jr. and Renat Akhmetshin. Veselnitskaya works for Fusion GPS on a separate case. And Akhmetshin, the other guy, the Russian intel guy that shows up at the Trump Tower meeting, you know who his lawyer is? Edward Lieberman. You know who Lieberman's wife is? Evelyn Lieberman, Bill Clinton's old chief of staff. Read the book, folks. It's all laid out for you. So <laughs> thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, 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 what do we have here? We have a conspiracy for obstruction of justice. That's what we have. A while back, I talked about the establishments, the establishments within the political parties, that on the Republican side, you had the Bush faction. The uh, Bush family ran the Republican Party for about 25 years as a, as a family business. They had their consultants, they had their people in place, and they ran the show for the Republican National Committee. They've done that for two and a half decades. And on the Republican side, they also had the Dole faction. And who worked for the Dole faction? Paul Manafort, Roger Stone, they worked for the Doles back in 1996. The Doles were at odds with the Bushes. The Trump team went to the Dole faction to get elected. That's the Republican faction. Now that, uh, and, and I'm going to 
kind of sort of twist a little bit here away from the main point, but I will get back to this in just a second. Because it was just released uh, with some of uh, Barbara Bush's uh, diaries that uh, she just, she blames uh, having a heart attack on Trump getting elected. Well, the fact is, she didn't like the fact that the next Bush in line, Jeb, didn't get the nomination. She didn't like the fact that Donald Trump actually took on Jeb at the South Carolina debate during the primaries. She did not like the fact that the Trump team, the Donald Trump, did not go to the Bush family for their help and their blessing in getting elected. They went to the rival faction, the Doles. I've said that many times before, and from all evidence I see, it's true. But the Democrats, and this is the point I want to bring in, the Democrats also have their establishment. They have the Clinton establishment, which goes against the Obama establishment for the control of the Democrat National Committee. The heart and soul of the Democratic Party. Just like you have the Bushes versus the Doles on the Republican side, you have the Clintons versus Obamas on the Democrat side. Now, with the Clinton faction, you've got a lot, just like the Bushes, you've got a lot of long standing connections, a long network of people. And this is the thing about the Clinton Family Foundation where you can take people from the campaign team, a campaign expires, you throw them into the foundation, they do consulting work for you. I don't know that they actually generate anything but stay on the payroll, but I don't have any evidence for or against. So they go to the Clinton Family Foundation and then from there they go into other agencies depending on whether or not the Democrats control things or not in government. But they know everybody. Now, if you happen to be Donald Trump and you have upset two factions of the political establishments, the powerful Bushes and the powerful Clintons, they've got enough contacts who know each other that the establishments within the bureaucracy try to take you down. That's what happened. That's what Dan Bongino just laid out, and he laid it out very, very well. It's a shame that our country has fallen to this point. It's a shame, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of reiterate kind of the words of Rand Paul, U.S. Senator from Kentucky. I am not a Rand Paul fan, and, and, and here's why. With Rand Paul, he spends a lot of time grandstanding. Now, he's a politician, don't they all? Well, in Rand Paul's case, a lot of times he'll point out in a speech, oh, Congress ha should have this power, or Congress gave it away, but he will not introduce legislation to actually take the power that Congress had given away in previous decades to the executive back to the legislative. He won't. He won't put out the bills, but he'll go out in the stump and make all these wonderful theoretical speeches. But my point with Rand Paul, <laughs> I lost my point, I'm sorry. Uh, that doesn't happen too often. Yes, I guess in this case, uh, you know, getting more back to the Rand Paul point, you know, we've given so much power from Congress. Congress has given so much power to the executive that there's an unelected bureaucracy that runs things out of Washington, D.C. And, and that's the point that Rand Paul does make very, very effectively. So yes, I did get back to my point. And that's a problem. And it's not just the intelligence agencies. I mean, even the Obamas weaponized the IRS, as Diane Bongino mentioned, in the Lois Lerner case. If you go back and study Watergate, especially if you weren't alive during the Watergate times, the stuff that the Obama team had done and the stuff that the Clinton team has done makes Richard Nixon look like St. Richard Nixon. We, we put articles of impeachment up for Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon is the only president of the United States of America to resign. 
and yet the stuff that the bureaucracy does to circumvent the rule of law in this country. You can put Richard Nixon on a pedestal and he looks like an angel. That's pretty disgusting. So when, Ron, when Rand Paul says that the Congress has surrendered too much of its responsibilities over to the executive, he is absolutely right. I will agree with him on that. And that was the Rand Paul point I wanted to make. So now the question is, where do we go from here? Where do we? Here's what I hope happens. And I have no idea if it's going to happen or not. I hope there's another special prosecutor. And everything that Dan Bongino said and everything that Peter Strzok and Lisa Page and Bruce Orr have all said in the closed door intel committee of the U.S. House, I hope that's all investigated. And this time I hope there's charges. My mother used to work for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. She was a secretary. She was not an agent. She left because she had me. Just before Watergate, mind you. But the fact is, the agency that she worked for was an agency she could have been proud of then. But the way the agency's acting now, there's no pride there. It's disgraceful. So I hope that an investigation is launched that will curtail some of the power. Personally, I think the same thing can be said of the CIA. If you look back at old Wild Bill Donovan from the old um, OSS from World War II, there was a time when we actually needed our intelligence agencies to keep us alerted to real threats out there. The FBI, I think that dates back to like the 1920s. But now I have a question. What legitimate reasons should the FBI and CIA exist today? Because I don't hear anything about what they're doing other than Trump collusion. Has the CIA actually kept us safe? How come the CIA let us down with 9-11? CIA wasn't doing its job. Well, I did hear that the CIA assets, uh, a lot of them were actually uh, funneled away by the Clinton administration, but that's another story for another day. So anyhow, we're going to leave you with this. Um, Trump has been vindicated so far. And perhaps now we can actually get back into governing this country the way it should be. So enough of the collusion, enough of the investigations. Hope you know, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. So we're going to leave you with the U.S. Marine Corps Band, the President's Own, with Hail to the Chief. For Dallas Pearson Producer, I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You're watching North Star Oasis. Thanks for watching. We'll see you.